Cool. Uh, does everybody see a giant uh, k-means clustering slide? What is yes. it? Sweet. Thanks for the thanks for the confirmation. That's great. Okay. Uh, today I want to talk about k-means clustering and another sort of related concept that we'll get to later called hierarchical clustering. Um, these are things that are relatively straightforward to understand, but they come up a lot in interviews and. Um, and a lot of people just don't take the time to understand them. They have like a hand wavy sense of how they work, but a lot like the uh, decision tree office hours that we've seen before, you can pull a lot of information out of these uh, systems that might not be evident if you don't understand them deeply. And uh, and little misunderstandings can lead to uh, pretty big mistakes. So um, today I'm gonna go over first this k-means clustering concept, and then we'll look at hierarchical later. K-means clustering is essentially an answer to uh, a question that is really, really hard to answer. Unsupervised learning. You know, what if you have a whole bunch of data, but you don't have classes, right? You don't have uh, classes that you can assign to different data points and then train an algorithm to become a classifier. But you know that there are like clusters of points that ought to be related together. You know, can you discover those clusters? How can you identify what those clusters are? Um, what I'm showing here is a two-dimensional problem implicitly. We have like a plane and you can imagine this is just about anything. I mean, uh, let's su suppose this is like a arm span maybe on the, uh, the y-axis and then height on the x-axis. And we have a distribution of people and it looks like, you know, we have two maybe, maybe two main clusters, one down here and then maybe one up here, depending on how you, how you want to frame it. Um, a whole bunch of reasons why we might want to do this, by the way. For one, we could be a t-shirt company, right? We might want to know, okay, like, do we have a, um, a cluster of customers? Like, maybe this is like the large size, maybe this is the medium or something like that. And like, how many t-shirt sizes do we need to make? Uh, these questions end up being very important for a lot of business applications. Now, looking at this, you might say, well, this seems like a silly problem to begin with, because when we just look at this two-dimensional plot, like, I can already visually pick out the clusters. There's like a cluster here, and there's a cluster there, and why do I need a fancy algorithm? And of course the answer is you need the algorithm because these problems aren't always two-dimensional. In fact, for the vast majority of cases, there'll be something ridiculous like 20-dimensional or 5-dimensional or 8-dimensional. So you can't visualize these easily. You need to come up with some kind of mechanism to automate the process of cluster discovery. And that's exactly what k-means clustering is going to do for us. So it's going to be a way for us to hopefully automate the discovery of, oh yeah, there's a cluster here, and oh yeah, there's a cluster here, when these clusters actually live not in two-dimensional space, not in three-dimensional space, but in like, you know, however many dimensional space. Okay, here's how this is going to work. Uh, we're first going to start with a guess. So we're going to pick two points, and we're going to give those points a color. Okay, so randomly pick two points. Let's say we pick this point up here and maybe this point here. Okay, just random choice. And one of them will cover, color it green, and then the other will color it red. And then we'll look at what are the points that are closest to the red point? And we'll, we'll color those points red as well. Sorry, somebody's trying to, whoop, trying to get in there. Yeah. We'll ask the question, what are the points that are closest to the red point? We'll color those red. And the points that are closest to the green point, we'll color those green. So just to show you exactly what I mean, here's what we've got. So we're going to randomly choose, say, two points. So we pick this one randomly, and we'll say, OK, let's call it the red point. And we pick this one, we will say, let's call that the green point. And you'll notice that all the points that are closest to the red point are now colored red. And all the points that are closest to the green point, we color them green. Okay? So random initialization, everything's random. This is just sort of like the, the problem setting we're starting with. Okay. Uh, there's no reason that this is going to be particularly useful just now. I mean, when we look at these red points, clearly that's not a well-defined cluster. And the same is true for the green ones. This isn't like a, a meaningful color scheme yet. But our goal now is going to be to start taking some steps to start to improve our guess about the location of the center of these clusters and move away from these random po uh, points that we selected at first and start to improve that guess. Because right now, these points, they're essentially our guess as to where the center of a cluster is. So we know there's like there's a red cluster somewhere, and we're guessing, just by random guessing, that it's centered here. 
And we know that there's a green cluster somewhere, so we're going to start by guessing that it's there. But now we're, let's try to take a step, an intelligent step, in the right direction to try to make these estimates a little bit more reliable and more accurate. Um, so here's how we're going to do that. We're going to take a look at all the green points. And we'll ask the question, what is the average position of all the points that are currently colored green? And this is, um, it, it's like a weighted average. So you're going to end up with like almost like a center of mass. You can imagine like if these green points were like, I don't know, weights on some kind of some kind of board, right? You're, you're basically looking almost for the equilibrium point of, of that board as it balances. So there, there are as many kind of points on, on one end as another. Anyway, a very rough kind of physics -y description. But basically, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the average position of all the green points, and then we're going to move our guess about the location of that cluster center to that average position, the average position of the green points we've colored in. And we'll do the same for the red. So let me just flip the slide. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. So now the green point, our guess about the, the middle of the cluster, it's kind of moved here. So this is about the average of the positions of all these, these green colored points, right? We've got two points and they're pretty far out there. So they are gonna disproportionately nudge us in that direction, but the majority of the green points are down here. And so that's why the point ends up there. And the same for the red, right? So we moved to the average position of all those red points. Okay, this is what we'll, call our updated guess. This is our new guess about what the center of these clusters actually is, right? So now we have our new guess. We're going to repeat the process that we started with. We're going to look at the red point. Oh, somebody is uh, tossed in a question here. Um, so it's like finding the centroid of the, yeah, of the, exactly, of the distribution of each cluster. That's right. In fact, th this is explicitly what these things are called. They're called cluster centroids. They're our guess as to where the center of the cluster actually lives. Yeah. And so what we've got here is two new guesses. We're gonna, again, we're going to repeat this process that we started with. So we'll look at the red point and we'll ask the question, okay, what points are closer to the red one than the green one? All the points that are closest to the red center that we're guessing right now, we're going to color those red. All the points that are closer to the green centroid will color those green. Okay, so Here's the, the new color scheme then. Okay, so you'll notice just these two points changed color because it turns out now they're actually closer to the red one than to the green centroid. So we color them red. And we'll repeat the process again. Now we have a new distribution of points that are red and a new distribution of points that are green. And we're once again gonna move our guesses to the average position of, of, those, uh, of those new colored points. And so that's gonna look something like this. So you can see like these two points, uh, these new red points basically shifted our guess for the centroid a little bit down towards them. And then because they're no longer green, now our cluster centroid for the green moves further down as well. And this is our new guess. Okay, now we're gonna repeat that process again. We're gonna say, okay, what are the points that are closest to the, the, the red centroid? And what are the points that are closest to the green centroid? Well, guess what? They're the same points that we're closest to those centroids in the last step. So there's no more change. We don't have to recolor any of these points. The algorithm, in other words, has converged. We've reached a stable equilibrium and there's no more iteration to be done. That we, we basically, well, that's, that's what you say. You say the algorithm has converged at this point. So Kamian's clustering actually has a natural termination point. And that termination point happens the moment that there's no further need to relabel points, to recolor points. There's sort of like this stable equilibrium that you've hit where the points don't get relabeled, so therefore there's no reason to move the guess of the center of the cluster, so therefore there's no reason to recolor the points. And so we, we hit that, that terminal state. And so this actually, I mean, if you zoom out and, and look at where we started, right, which was here, these were some pretty awful guesses. We recolor, we um, moved our, uh, our points to a more appropriate location, recolored, re-guessed, and and that ended up leading to this, this very kind of nice and, in fact, it looks like correct assessment of where these cluster centroids ought to be. And actually, I think I might have missed a... Uh, oh, no, I didn't. Okay, great. Okay, so that's how you end up doing clustering with k-means clustering. We essentially were able to close our eyes. If this whole problem was unfolding in like eight-dimensional space, uh, it would still be solved in the same way. It's still it's still the same procedure, and it, there's no reason that it, it doesn't generalize, and uh, in fact, it does. 
Uh, any questions about this process, this sort of iteration? Okay. Cool. I mean, if you get this, this is the, the hardest part of k-means clustering. It, it's the core of the algorithm, and the rest is really just going to be looking at ways that this fails, like situations where this really isn't a, a, a good way to go and what can go wrong with it. And, and the first one I want to draw your attention to is, um, it's kind of an interesting problem. It turns out that the cluster guesses you end up with actually depend heavily on the random guesses you started with. So you notice like our random initialization was here and here, right? We randomly guessed, you know, okay, we'll say this is the red point and that's the green point. And then from there, we ended up here. If we started, however, with like a different set of points, I don't know, this one and this one, we might have ended up with a slightly different clustering. And here's an extreme example of, of uh, what can happen in, the, in those cases. So let's take a look at this just distribution here, right? So now we're going to pick this point and this point. Okay, so green and red. And it turns out, if you pick those two points, that the very first, uh, the very first iteration will actually, it'll be the last iteration, because you'll end up saying, okay, well, you know, you look at this point, and you say, which points are closest to the, the green centroid? Well, it's kind of all the points that are on this like on this side of the, the line that sort of bisects this, this whole cluster of points, and then the other ones are red. And there's no real need to iterate any further because the, you're already pretty close to the center of, of the uh, group of points, and you're essentially going to end up with this very messed up uh, clustering of your, of your points. And this just happens. I mean, it's an artifact. It's, it's pure luck. And I had to think really carefully to set up a situation that would actually add up to something like this. But it can and does happen, and it's something to be aware of. It gives you a really kind of messed up, um, a messed up clustering result. Uh, is anybody unclear on like why this um, this particular error has happened, or you, does anybody want to ask any questions about it? Aruj, is is everything good at your end? Can you repeat the question one more time? Oh sure, yeah. No, I was just wondering if anyone was unclear on like the reason why in this case, like if you pick these two points as the initial cluster centroids, you end up with like this really messed up clustering where you know these are the green points here clearly don't belong to like one cluster, and the red points don't either. Um, is it clear why that happens? Yeah, Daniel. Oh, uh, I can't, uh, I don't seem to be able to hear you, Daniel. Sorry, I'm not sure if it's uh, maybe the mic or, or, or whatever else. If you don't mind writing your question, if you have one, on the chat, um, I can turn to it in a minute. But uh, yeah, so for now, I mean, this is really one of the main issues with, uh, with clustering algorithms. And, well, there's a solution to it. Um, or at least there's there's a half solution, and then there's another half solution that we'll touch on in just a minute. So the first half solution is, well, you could always try this again, right? If you repeat this process with another set of points, usually you'll get something that looks more like this than like this. And so you're less likely to end up with like a really messed up set of clusters. In fact, that's kind of the point of this algorithm. It's fairly robust, but every once in a while it gives you something bad like this. The problem is we need to find a way to tell when that's actually happening. Because again, like we can't just visualize these clusters. Life doesn't throw two-dimensional problems at us all the time. This could be an eight-dimensional problem. And if it is, how do we know which cluster centroid results to trust? Like if we can't actually just create a plot like this, how would we tell, oh, this cluster centroid uh, guess is better than, than this other one and then keep the good one? So, uh, oh. And sorry, somebody just sent a message here. Uh, so Navjot asks, uh, how do we know if the clustering is done correctly? Well, that's a great question. Actually, that's exactly that's exactly related to the to, to this problem that we're we're looking at here. So, how do we know that what makes clusters good? What is, in other words, the metric that tells us how good of a job our clustering algorithm has done? Because unless we have a number, some number that kind of tells us, okay, if this number is really like high or low, then that means our clusters are good. Unless we have that number, we can't, you know, 
test out different random initializations and, and keep the best ones because we have no way of knowing which is the best one. So that's the central question here. What is the number that, that's going to tell us whether or not our clusters are good? What's the number, in other words, that tells this situation apart from this situation? And I'll, I'll give you a little hint. I mean, so here, actually, I'll, I'll give you the answer, but we'll work our way there one step at a time. So one of the things you might notice here is our points are smeared out, right? They're very smeared out. If you compare them to this scenario, our points are pretty, you know, they're clustered in pretty tight. I mean, on average, the green points are kind of close to the green cluster centroid, and the red points are also kind of close to the red cluster centroid. So it almost seems like what we're going for is minimizing the distance between, on average, all those points and their, the center of their cluster, right? So there's something like if we add up together, maybe, the distance from point 0.1 to the cluster centroid and the distance from point 0.2 to the cluster centroid and point 0.3 and so on for all the points in the red cluster and do the same for all the points in the green cluster and we add up all those distances, that will give us one number that tells us how tightly packed or how smeared out these clusters actually are. And that's the number that people actually use when they do k-means clustering. So this is actually, if you think about it, it's kind of like a standard deviation. Like if you imagine a, a bell curve, a Gaussian distribution, right? The standard deviation is really the spread of the points about the mean. And the mean, I mean, the cluster centroid really is a guess about where the mean of that cluster is, the average position of the points in that cluster. And so the more spread the points are about that mean, the worse a job of clustering it's done. And so that's essentially how we're going to be able to solve this problem, even if we can't visualize these clusters. We'll try a whole bunch of different random initializations, and we'll keep the one that minimizes the sum of the distances, basically, uh, from each point to to the center of its cluster. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? Dope. Okay. Sweet. So that's that's the metric that we're looking for, and unfortunately, it'd be great if, if that was all we needed, and um, it, it gets us a good chunk of the way there. But there is one more problem, and that's because there's a way to cheat. If you pick that metric, if all you cared about was the distance between points in a cluster and the centroid of that cluster, then why not come up with as many cluster centroids as you can? Like in this problem, we decided to initialize two different guesses, right? We said, okay, you know, I'll guess that there's a red cluster and a green cluster. And then from there, we went about figuring out, okay, given that we think that there's a red cluster and a green cluster, where do we think those cluster centers are. But in general, you don't actually know that your data has two or three or 10 or a million uh, different cluster, uh, different uh, groups or clusters of points. You don't actually know what the right number of cluster centroids is to even start with. So again, it's a bit misleading for me to say, okay, you know, we, we have clearly two clusters and so we randomly initialize two guesses for two different centers, centroids. That's basically me kind of like, uh, begging the question. I, I'm, I'm essentially like using the information that I, sh I shouldn't have had in order to um, uh, in order to solve the problem. So in practice, this is a separate problem, figuring out how many clusters you should add. Because if you added a whole bunch, let's say we, we added as many cluster centroids or we, we randomly initialized as many cluster centroids as we had points here. If we did that, then on average, every point would be exactly at the center of its cluster because there's only one point in the cluster. So, you know, the average position of one point is just the point. And as a result, the distance would be zero. So this metric that we're tracking, the spread, the smear, if you actually just had a single point in a cluster, that smear would be zero. And so it would look as though you're doing a great job of clustering your points, but that's only because you added a ton of centroids. So in practice, these are two things that you have to trade off against each other. How many centroids am I going to add versus what's that spread, what's that, um, that sum of all the distances from their respective uh, cluster centroids? And that's a difficult question, uh, but I just want to make sure that it's clear what that question is. Does anybody have any, 
any questions about what I've just laid out there? Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Adrian, I, I'm just going to check in with you. Is, is everything cool? Yeah, totally. Um, I guess my only question, but it's, maybe it's something you can answer later. It's just about defining the distance between the points because I'm assuming right now for the sake of the example you're presenting, you're using like straight line Euclidean distance. Uh, and I will be interested to hear about like an example using like Manhattan distance, for example. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's another one of those things where like, it's not super clear what the right answer is out the gate. So in practice, mm -hmm. people do just use Euclidean distance. Um, and yeah. it's, uh, I think I'd need like a degree in philosophy to know exactly why Euclidean and not the L1 norm or, or you know, whatever else. But uh, no, mm -hmm. you're right that it's an interesting question. Yeah, I'm just gonna make a, com uh, a quick comment it's because I, I can't help, but, and I think I've mentioned this before. I can't help but look at this, you know, this data as spatial data, you know, like data, like the points on a map. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I'm when I'm think of when I think of distance, you know, you play the distance drops a purpose when it's just in terms of like trying to find clusters of you know just attributes and trying to um, like segment your data into different populations. Um, but when it comes to special data, uh, having Euclid in this sense sometimes, um, you know, hides like the true complexity of actual distance between points. And I've been trying to, if that's a problem, I've been trying to uh, to deal with simply because um, I can't apply like a network analysis API on like 4 million data points. So I have to use Euclid in this sense to, uh, you know, as a, as a bit of a shortcut. But that's, I think that's a different conversation. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um I think buried in that is an assumption about the the shape of the um uh I gotta watch what my terminology is. It's not I don't think the manifold, but basically the sh the geometry of the space you're looking at. So if you if you look at planet Earth, it is curved. So Euclidean distance isn't actually doesn't actually hold over over long distances. Eventually, the curvature of the Earth matters. In this case, we are assuming a consistent metric just because. Um, or are you basically that we live in Euclidean space just because there's no reason to like bias against that you know we, we assume that every dimension is just you know a spatial dimension and that's more or less how we do it so I think it's more a special thing about working out distances on the surface of a giant sphere uh, that make it a harder problem whereas in this case we get to do it with, you know solve that problem without that constraint so that's sort of why I think Euclidean in this case tends to be preferred um, but it's a, it's a really interesting thing to explore, actually. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, so just to, to make it really concrete and, and to illustrate what we've been talking about in terms of like, you know, what if you have many different cluster centroids? Um, here, here's what that might look like. So, so we've looked at, um, this is what you get if you guess that there are two cluster centroids, right? And like the result looks cool and that's wonderful. Uh, here's what you guess get if you guess that there are three. Right or at least one um, one thing that you might end up with, and so you'll notice like okay we resolve one cluster really nicely, but then we have this thing which really feels like it should be one cluster, and it kind of gets forced into breaking up into two clusters just because we have too many cluster centroids. So we end up essentially splitting up our problem unnecessarily, and there's a word for this. It's called overfitting, and you've encountered it I'm sure in other contexts. This is what it looks like when k nearest uh, sorry k means clustering overfits. The way it manifests is you basically break up clusters into subclusters that kind of don't mean anything. And that's a bit of an issue. And it, it's, uh, it's something that you don't want to have happen. But again, it's something that you can't always tell is happening. Like if this was happening in eight dimensional space, we wouldn't really have a way of noticing it, um, at least not as cleanly as this. It's not like we can just look at our points and go, oh, clearly that cluster should be one cluster and not two. So the question then is, how do we catch this? Like, how do we notice in high dimensional space when this sort of thing is happening, when we've used too many centroids in our, uh, in our setup? And the answer is something to use something called the elbow method. You might have heard of this before, maybe in other contexts, or maybe in this one. Um, oh, maybe I should have mentioned, uh, when we talk about k-means clustering, that k, k is the number of cluster centroids. It's a hyperparameter. And so this is, um, let me just scroll up here. So this is the k equals 2 uh, approach to solving this problem. And then this might be the k equals 3 approach to solving this problem. 
So k is just the number of cluster centroids. As we increase the number of cluster centroids, inevitably, the spread, that number that we were talking about measuring that tells us like how nice our clusters are, that number is going to improve, or it's going to go down, in other words. The average distance of points from their cluster centroids will go down, in general, as we add more cluster centroids, just because we have more you know, places where they can serve as the center of a mini cluster, right? Um, it, I mean, it's, it's sort of like if the cluster centroid is like the, the subway station, you add more subway stations across the city and like, yeah, no shit, like on average, people are going to be much closer to a subway stop, but it's possible to add too many or at least more than is worth it based on the, the price of creating more stops. And in this case, you know, if you're a city planner looking at this, you might say, okay, clearly we need like a subway station right there. I'm pretty sure we don't need one here and one here. Like we just need one in this cluster and that's it. And so this begins to kind of hint at part of what determines that number K, the number of cluster centroids. Usually in a business context, there is a cost associated with increasing the number K, right? So we talked about the, the subway example. We could also talk about like the t-shirt example that we were talking about earlier, which is like, yo, know, let's say that this is arm span, this is height. You know, we're trying to decide what t-shirt sizes should we make? And like the answer might be, okay, you know, we want... A, a large here and a medium here, but if we break our clusters up too much that we end up having like this weird, you know, a medium one and a medium two, and that costs us money. We need maybe a different machine to make each of these different um, sizes of t-shirts. And so your choice about how many cluster centroids there are is inextricably linked to the business question. What benefit are you going to get in terms of the reduction? Like how much do we gain um, in terms of the spread of those points on average from the cluster centroid versus what's the cost of introducing a new cluster centroid. That trade-off is what in practice you're going to be worrying about. And that, that's really what this elbow method is showing us. So see this, this thing, I don't know if it's too blurry on, on your screens, but it says sum of squared distances. Okay, sum of squared distances, what is that? Well, that's the L2 norm. That's, that's the Euclidean distance essentially um, uh, between the, on average, the points in their cluster centroid. So if we look at, at first, with one cluster centroid, it, it's just awful, right? You have, like, the, on average, these points are super far from their cluster centroid. It's like you've got a subway station, you know, maybe right downtown or something like that, but, like, everybody in the suburbs can't access it, so, you know, it's a really bad situation. You add the next subway stop or the next cluster centroid, and all of a sudden, there's this huge increase in, in um, a huge improvement, a huge decrease in the average distance of those points from their cluster centroid really dramatic change. And so you might say, hey, that was really worth it. Or you might just look at the size of this drop and say, hmm, well, if I know it costs $50 million to build a new subway stop, or if I know that it costs like $50,000 to build a new t-shirt machine for a new size of t-shirt, then, you know, how, how does that trade off against the benefit to my customers of having a more custom sized shirt or a, a better location for a subway stop? And it's hard to tell, right? I mean, you'd have to actually look at that that drop and justify it at each stage. Um, likewise, you know, you add a third one and look at that, another big drop. And a fourth one, now the drop really starts to get a little bit smaller, right? Less and less of a benefit from adding each successive cluster centroid. Until eventually, I mean, way over here, once you get to eight and above, or I would say really five or six and above, it's, you know, you're really getting into like this territory here. You're starting to split clusters into subclusters and, you know, whether or not you can see it, it might be a high dimensional problem. You might not be able to plot it, but that's really what's, what this is telling you here is you're getting very low marginal returns for that extra marginal cluster. And so what people often say is like the reason this is called the elbow method is, you know, you've got a plot that sort of looks like an elbow, right? And then you want to pick where the elbow is, where, where the curvature gets sharpest. And people will say, oh, like that elbow somewhere around here, that's where you want to cut off your clustering. You don't want to add more centroids beyond that point because you're going to hit diminishing returns and start overfitting. I hope it's clear from this conversation so far that that idea is wrong. It's not that you're just looking for the elbow. By the way, the elbow is really hard to find, right? I mean, is it is it like three? Is it four? Is it five? I could even see it being six. Like, I don't know, but it's, it's sure maybe somewhere in there. But the fundamental thing that actually decides whether or not you want to cut things off at, at a certain number of cluster centroids is the cost 
is the expense of adding that extra centroid. That expense, you know, we talked about whether it would be like a $50 million subway stop or a $50,000 um, uh, t-shirt like mich uh, making machine. But for you as a data scientist, there's an additional cost, which is just interpretability, right? When you start breaking the clusters down, like, okay, so the first, the first clustering that we did, which ended up like with this situation, that's nice. It gives you like some very simple interpretable clusters. The fewer clusters you have, the more interpretable things will tend to be. As you start going into overkill mode and you start doing this and it's like subsplitting clusters up, like, I don't know, I really can't tell you why, you know, this particular subcluster exists or why this one exists. At a certain point, the noise that causes points to spread about the, the mean of the cluster becomes more important than the information that causes things to cluster in the first place. And so that, that's really where your job as a data scientist trying to interpret what these clusters actually mean becomes hampered by just adding more and more of these centroids. So that's really what you're looking for um, is, is a combination of interpretability and then also knowing just like, you know, what does a cluster represent? Are we making like more t-shirt sizes? Are we, uh, are we building subway stops? Like what is the expense here? And what is the benefit of each of these drops? Like are they worth that trade-off? Any, any questions about that? Uh, Nevjo, does everything cool? Just picking on random people here, but yeah, all good. Okay, great. Uh, ba, ba, ba. All right, so hopefully that gives you an idea here for for the elbow method uh, principle. Again, I really don't endorse the elbow method. Uh, it, it gives you like a vague notion. The name does at least of like what you're looking for is that like risk reward um, tapering, but. Keep in mind the business problem dictates that that number of clusters. And if you make a show of knowing that in interviews, that's really going to impress the crap out of your interviewer. So just try to remember that in this context. Uh, good. Okay. So most people know about k-means clustering. They may have seen it sketched out before. They definitely haven't thought, at least most people, of situations like this. They haven't thought of situations like this. They haven't sort of fully appreciated what the elbow method means and, and when you should or should not use it. Um, and that's great. So k-means clustering, you understand now quite deeply, uh, and certainly well enough for interviews. I think that the next um, the next clustering algorithm we're going to look at is one that fewer people will be familiar with. It's it's actually kind of a nice one, and it's used reasonably frequently, which is why I wanted to cover it. Uh, but it's also way more interpretable, and it's called hierarchical clustering. So Hierarchical clustering is going to start with the same kind of premise that we did with k-means. So we're going to imagine in this case, two-dimensional problem, you know, again, let's say like arm span here and height here or something like that. And um, instead of randomly initializing cluster centroids and like trying to, you know, follow that k-means clustering process, what we'll do is we'll start by looking at pairs of points. So we're going to essentially start to construct clusters Pairwise, start with a pair of points, then look at another pair of points and another pair of points. And out of pairs of points, we're going to construct clusters almost from the ground up. And this is really like the, the um, philosophical difference between hierarchical clustering and k-means clustering. K-means is almost like a, a top-down thing. Your clusters already exist and you're just trying to find them. Whereas hierarchical, you're really building them up from the ground up. So as you'll see, this kind of leads to a very different sort of problem, um, not problem statement, but like a solution uh, or a different form of a solution. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by looking for the pair of points that's closest together. So what are the two points that are closest to each other? And it looks like it's these two points here, right? So these, uh, these two suckers. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a horizontal line. And that horizontal line is going to be red. So if you look over here at this this little these three lines that I've drawn out here, just focus on on this top red one, okay? The length of that red line is the distance between those two points. Okay? So if those two points if if the, if the two closest points were a lot closer together, then this red line would be shorter be like a little stump. Uh, if they got further away, the red line would be longer. So this essentially represents how far are these two points away from each other. And the, the lower one here does as well. Next, we're going to say, okay, what is 
the average position of these two points. So the average position of those two points is just like the point in between them, this new red point. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, why don't we replace those two blue points with just that red point that represents the average position of those points? Boom. Okay, and we're keeping these lines that, that still encode that information about how far apart they were originally. And now we're going to repeat the process. We're going to ask, what is the next closest pair of points? Well, it turns out it's these guys here. Actually, here, let me move back. It's, it's these two guys down here, right? And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to uh, identify the point that's between the two of them, the average location of those points. We're going to draw another horizontal line. This time it's going to be green. I'm color coding the point in the middle green as well, just to show which one it relates to. And again, the distance between those two points is encoded in the length of that green segment. You'll notice that's why this green line is longer than the red line here, because these points were the closest together, and these are the second closest together. So they're a little further apart, so that line is a little bit longer. Okay. So again, we get rid of those points, and, and we end up just with, with that green one. And what we're going to do is we're going to repeat this process. We eventually are going to have to start merging together points that are like the red and green point, like the average location of two previous points. And so, you know, eventually we get to the point where like, I don't know, maybe we're merging these two guys here and we have to make another, um, another uh, kind of horizontal line and so on. And so we repeat this process, merging together pairs of points, pairs of points, um, and eventually, when we end up merging, for example, uh, maybe a, a red, in this case I'm showing a red with a green, we're actually going to draw a, um, uh, a horizontal line and a vertical line that connect the red and green points. So this is essentially showing you we're building up from the ground up, pairwise, this structure, which is called a dendrogram, which encodes the distance between all these points. Sorry, somebody's trying to get in. And so this is what you end up with at the end of the day. It, again, it's called a dendrogram. And it's um, actually, I, I think um, Hadrian's going to appreciate this because this really is spatial data. I mean, this, this is how far, um, actually, sorry, it's not quite how far apart cities are. I shouldn't say that. This is based on a, a mix of demographic and cultural information about different cities. And what you can see here, it's really interesting, is that cities that are most like each other end up not only in the same kind of cluster uh, or, or kind of bit high level cluster. Ooh, let me just zoom out. Oh, geez. There we go. So we have these high level clusters, right, that, that kind of are uh, defined at the very top level. And then we have these lower level clusters, right, that start to resolve a little bit more. And then we have really small clusters that are very fine. And so what, what this does is it shows you essentially the structure of the data. It shows you like not only do you have big clusters that you know take you from like in this case Cape Town all the way down to San Francisco, all these cities. Yeah, they're like one very broad cluster, which is clearly different from like Cairo to um, Manila down here. I don't know if you can you probably can't read that, but um, but anyway, so they're clearly different from from those. But also, we can say that Cape Town, Cape Town to Rio de Janeiro is very different from Caracas to San Francisco. So you're sort of getting a lot more richness in that, in that sort of cluster um, diagram. And what this allows you to do is to decide more clearly where you want to place the boundary. Like at what point do you want to say, okay, that's enough detail for me, that's enough centroids, I'm going to call it here. So you can imagine like drawing almost like a vertical line, a slice that says, okay, we're going to cut things off here. Right? If we cut things off here, then we end up with one, two, three, four clusters. If we cut things off here, we end up with one, two, three clusters. If we cut things off here, we end up with two. If we cut things off like down here, we end up with like a whole bunch of clusters. And probably at that point, we're really going to start to overfit. And so that would be you know, the equivalent to what we were looking at earlier, kind of a situation like this. right? So these would be like high level clusters and then maybe these are like, you know, you're getting to really similar cities, you're splitting hairs really. And uh, while you're getting really good resolution, again, there's a cost, right? There's a cost every time you introduce a new cluster because it gives you more to analyze, it gives you more to explain. So like 
you know, you imagine you had to write a report on this. Would you rather write a report to like a bunch of business stakeholders that explains what the differences are between like this cluster, this cluster, and this cluster at this level, or between like the, you know, 15 clusters that you get if you slice it down this way? So it depends on how you value your time, what the marginal benefits are in either direction. Um, and it's something to like think about deeply. You definitely don't just want to go like, ah, yeah, you know, this feels right, because that would be the equivalent of actually playing the elbow method game over here, where you kind of go like, hmm, like where is the elbow? Is it three? Is it four? Is it five? What do I feel like today? And like anytime you catch yourself saying, what do I feel like today in data science? It's over. Like you're not doing it right. So ask yourself, you know, what is the marginal benefit and what is the cost of, of adding more of these clusters? My guess is you'll find more often than not that that means you're better off going with, with fewer rather than more. Um, any questions about the, the stuff, hierarchical or, or the k-mean stuff we covered? Oh, Daniel, this is heartbreaking. I still can't hear you. Uh, can, you can you type something maybe into the chat? Yeah, sorry. Um, while, while Daniel types, I'll, I'll just check in with uh, uh, a couple more folks. I guess, uh, Aruj, I'm guessing you, you still can't speak or that your mic is still going to be muted. I'll check with uh, Andre. Uh, Andre, is everything cool? Uh, no, no questions on my end. Um, it's funny that we touched on this today because I've been working on this at work, actually, so it's really helpful. Oh, got it. Um, so, okay. yeah. Awesome. Um, I, ha I have a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. And, and Daniel, I, I just saw your question, so I will get to it. Yeah, Hadrian, go ahead. Uh, just real quick. So um, if you want to optimize your clustering, would it make sense to, because you said like it, this is like a, something like that, that's multidimensional, so you can have uh, a lot of different attribute data that you're clustering. Uh, and I'm also thinking that would it be would it make sense if you wanted to optimize your your clusters to remove all attribute features which have like a completely random uh, distribution? So this way, you're more or less guaranteed to have patterns identified as opposed to you know like splitting hair and uh, overfitting on some attribute features. Yeah, this is a really uh, good and really challenging question. So. The short answer is it's not always obvious when a distribution of points is random. Um, the reason I'm saying that is we, we can't answer the question is, like for example, is height random without referring to other variables as well. Height on its own might look like, I mean, it might have, there might be a, a flat distribution, you know, just constant across all heights. It might look like a Gaussian or whatever, but height plus weight or height plus arm span or height plus age, those things are going to be correlated in really interesting ways. And so if you just did like a narrow analysis where you said, okay, let me, you know, let me plot the height variables, anything interesting going on here, it might not be obvious. And the worst part is, you know, we could say, okay, fine, then I'll do a bunch of two by two plots, right? Uh, so I, I'll do height versus arm span, I'll do height versus weight, and then I'll figure it out. And if everything looks random, then I'll say, fine, screw it, height's no good, and I'll ditch it. But the problem then would be that you could have even higher order relationships where height versus weight might not mean anything. But when you combine height, weight, and like income or height, weight, and something else, then all of a sudden something comes into view. And so one of the challenges, this is actually at the core of the really where the value comes from in machine learning, is machine learning is, is explicitly able to account for like large relationships between large numbers of features. And, uh, and the clustering can as well. And, and that's sort of like, that's the, the challenge. You're absolutely right when you say you want to err on the side of ripping out stuff that might just contribute noise. So, you know, we'll talk about feature selection in another office hour, that's like its own topic. But if you identify a feature as not being particularly informative, then 100% do ditch it because you're totally right. All that can do is give you a bunch of noise that just makes overfitting more likely. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yes it does. Okay, sweet. A lot of good questions today, guys. Um, and Daniel asks, so which arm of the horizontal distance 
uh, do you use to tell the distance in the cluster? Which uh, which arm of the two horizontal distances in the dendrogram? Oh yeah, okay, dendrogram, right, right, right. Okay, uh, yeah, so let, let's look at this example here. So one of the things that you can tell right off the bat is that there are different lengths to different arms, right? And I, I think, let me just reread to confirm. Yeah, which arm, exactly, which arm of the two horizontal distances? Okay, so if I understand, uh, Daniel, your question correctly, basically we've got one arm that's pretty long here and one arm that's really short. So like, what gives, what's the, what's the deal here? And the short answer is it looks like it looks hard to interpret if you start from the right and move to the left. But if you start on this side and move upwards, it will be a little bit more clear. So if I zoom in, um, you'll notice that at the very first level, these arms are always the same length, right? And that's because we're just combining two points together and like whatever the distance is between those two points, like I said before, you know, that really does become um, the, the length of that horizontal segment. But it's only when we start to combine merged points. See like LA, Los Angeles, and San Francisco? Those two merge together here. And like that new point is now kind of has like a, a shorter distance to go than like, um, than, uh, sorry, not a shorter distance to go. It, sorry. Um, basically, this horizontal line just represents the distance from Mexico City to that merged point. And then this is really like a largely um, a largely aesthetic artifact, if you will. The information is gonna be contained if you're wondering like, okay, what's the distance from like this particular city to a, to a, a cluster or, or, or a city? It just, it's essentially the horizontal line next to the city name that gives that away. Does that uh, make sense, Daniel? Okay, sweet, cool. Yeah, um, great, great questions, and, and it's actually something I should have mentioned uh, as I was going through it. Yeah, so it really, these things, it's not that they read best from left to right, but like if you're looking to understand the math, uh, yeah, it's definitely way more confusing to go from the right to the left because dendrograms are built from the bottom up, like like we saw, right? They, they really do start like pairwise, you know, pairwise and so on. Like it's not, they're not designed, like k-means kind of goes in the other direction, right? We start from the top, work, sort of work our way down. Um, anyway, just a sort of thing to, to keep in mind there. Um, Andre asks, is eyeballing the results a good way of determining the optimal number of clusters? Or is there a threshold for the distance within cluster? Yeah, yeah, great question. Okay, so just going back here, and um, uh, so Andre, I'm, I'm guessing that the, um, or sorry, Andre, I, I don't know if, sorry. <laughs> I, my priors are reading in French there. Um, so, oh, sorry, is there a question? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so, so if I interpret your, your question correctly, essentially you're looking at this saying, well, okay, Jeremy, like I get it. You're, you're drawing a, a vertical line here and you're kind of saying like, hey, it looks like, you know, we've, we've got about this many clusters. You're like, let's draw the line here. How do you tell where to draw the line? And the answer really does come down to that, like that business question that we talked about earlier. It's just a matter of like, how much is it going to cost you to write a report that it has to explain three different clusters versus five different clusters or eight, right? And you kind of have to decide for yourself how much time you have, how much you're willing to dig into your data, and then what the value would be. Because if, if you look at these cities, right, if you're like a travel agent and you've got clients who come to you and they're like, Hey, like I want to plan my next trip. I, you know, I, I went to Cape Town and I really enjoyed Cape Town. What other cities should I visit? Well, you know, visually you can just say like, okay, like Buenos Aires will be pretty nice or, and Rio de Janeiro will be pretty nice. But if you're looking for something like vaguely similar and you've already visited those two cities, then yeah, you might want to check out like, I don't know, uh, Honolulu or Caracas or something like that. You definitely are not going to want to check out like Moscow because it's in a completely different higher level cluster, right? So the travel agent example is a great, uh, it's a great example of like a low stakes um, situation where the clusters really don't cost you anything. Like you might as well see the whole dendrogram, you might as well explain the whole thing, that's fine. But in many cases, like the, um, you know, we talked about uh, the, where is it? Here, we, so we talked about the subway example. 
a cluster, a cluster centroid for a subway is hella expensive, right? You don't want to have to build a new subway station. And so going further is really going to cost you a lot of money. In those cases, you're probably going to be looking for any excuse to place the line here. So I can't give you a ratio. Uh, you've, you've done a great job of framing it, actually. This is a great metric. Distance within the cluster divided by distance between clusters. That's, that is really clever, and you're right. That, that's like the, that would be a, a really interesting metric to use to guide your decision-making here. But in practice, it's always going to come down to like how much can you afford to put into this. And um, unfortunately, the answer in many business uh, cases is, is quite limited. But in some cases uh, where information is cheap, or, or you know you don't have to provide such a big explanation for the, the different clusters because the, um, the the stakes are really low, then by all means go as far as you want. Uh, I, th I think one last thing I'll mention is this process of hierarchical clustering. This is an extremely time-consuming algorithm to run, right? So if you think about what's happening, like how did we determine that this was the best pair of points to uh, to merge together? How did we know that these two were the closest points and that we should bundle them together before moving on to the next pair? Well, the answer is trial and error, unfortunately. We literally had to look at the distance between every pair of points in this entire data set to figure out, oh, okay, those two points are the closest together. And unfortunately, that makes this an n squared problem, or like at least a, I think it's like an n log n problem at best. Um, which can make it somewhat slow. It's, it's not the end of the world, but essentially this is, this is a bit of a blocker when you get to really huge data sets. And uh, yeah, anyway, as a result, like, you know, at, at every stage, right, like now after we merge these points together, we have to go through this all over again. We have to say, okay, again, what is the closest pair of points? And, and repeat and so on. Um, actually, you don't have to redo that calculation, which is exactly why this is uh, log n, uh, not, uh, sorry, n log n and not n squared. Anyway. Bottom line is it can take a while and uh, large data sets, you know, not always the, uh, the your, your best friend with this. And the same is actually true of k-means clustering. So what you often will find yourself doing, and, and this is something that people sometimes need permission to do. I found like there people are terrified of like taking a subset of their data and then running the algorithm on that because they think that like, oh no, if I, what if I picked, you know, the wrong 5,000 points out of my 100,000 points? That's totally cool. For the vast majority of cases, um, do a little bit of first principles thinking to like make sure that to first order it kind of makes sense to do this. But as long as you have a randomly selected representative sample of points, uh, your your clustering algorithm is going to work quite well. So you know don't don't worry so much about throwing all, you know all all your entire massive data set at this. If your data set's big, pull out a subset. And, and do your hierarchical clustering or your k-means clustering on that subset. Don't worry about the whole thing um, because it's just not worth it. You're going to find real. I mean, it's it's uh, what is it? It's this game all over again, right? Like if what what is what is the benefit if you already have five thousand points? What's the benefit of plotting with ten thousand unless your five thousand points happen to be syst like systematically biased in in a certain direction to ignore some clusters in favor of others? Um, Anyway, so I think that's about all I, oh, uh, oh no, sorry, that was uh, Andre's original comment. I think that's about all I have to say here on this topic. Does anybody have any final questions about this? Um, yeah, I have a question for anybody else as a yeah. question. Uh, so I'm wondering then, because this is not like, you know, suitable obviously for uh, predictive analysis, right? It's only meant for, to be able to, Categorize it into 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 groups, then you know, uh, then are, which are then interpreted in ways that make sense to the uh, to the analyst. Uh, is this suitable for creating um, for feature engineering for you know like other types of machine learning models? For example, like I run this, uh, I run like a k-means clustering. I get different clusters, which I can then have as label for my data set, and then I can run that through like a predictive machine learning model. Is that, will that be something that makes sense, or is there like a huge flaw with that, uh, with that idea? No, I, you're, you're totally right. Okay, so, so I'm going to zoom out and interpret that question. I think in, in actually the way you asked it was great. You're like like what, are, what are the use cases for this algorithm? How does it interact with like standard supervised learning uh, problems and so on? So 
I mean, I think the first one is there are simply a lot of problems that take this form, right? So, you know, we talked about the, the subway example and just finding, like, you know, where should we build the next subway station uh, or what, what's the next t-shirt size we should make and so on. So those cases where you just don't have the labeled data, the nice thing is kind of nature makes the choice for you. Like, if there are no labels, then, like, hey, you're either going to do clustering or you're not going to do anything. And the question that then naturally comes up is, what value can I get from clustering? Will clustering tell me something that's interesting and useful? Uh, now, you're absolutely right. Clustering does give you what are effectively labels that you could imagine using for training. Uh, a bit of a circular problem in many cases if you imagine using this for training, though, because essentially your, uh, your classification algorithm that you'll get out of this is only going to be as good as the cluster centroids that you guessed in the first place. And so it's almost as if the cluster, uh, the uh, k-means clustering algorithm itself is already about as good as, you know, as uh, any algorithm you could make, uh, any supervised algorithm you could make based on the cluster, the cluster centroids that it guesses. Um, there is an exception. And that exception is pre-training of certain, I mean, usually this applies to more like deep learning, like neural network models. In that case, label data is super rare. So imagine like, um, let, let's take, uh, geez, uh, let's take classifying literature or something like that as an example, right? So maybe I don't have a data set that has like, you know, uh, the first page of a book and then the category that it belongs to. Maybe I'm missing that category. Uh, and I, ha I have like 100,000 different books that I want to classify. So maybe I start with a clustering algorithm on like the first, um, I don't know, 99,000. But then for that last 1,000 books, I can actually afford to hand label those, those books. So essentially what I can then do is train a machine learning algorithm on the classes that the clustering algorithm predicted to sort of get it, give it a head start, and then fine tune it using those um, those hand uh, hand uh, written labels, and so that process is actually that can be a really good one two punch where you're essentially playing off the benefit of like the highly scalable labeling that comes from the the clustering, and, and that's you know it's there are going to be mistakes in that and that's fine, but then you have a fine tuning data set that you use to really make sure you're refining your predictions. And so that's often how these things are done, different forms of unsupervised learning that are used for like that course um, that, that course training, and then the fine training gets done with handwritten uh, stuff, or not handwritten, but hand uh, annotated data. So, so that's one strategy, one way you could imagine using this. Um, yeah, I, I think those are the two main families of, um, uh, yeah, families of use cases. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Well, as I say, that's that's about all I got. But uh, anybody else have any questions before we hop off here? Okay. Cool, cool, cool. I'll post the video in a minute. And um, yeah, in the meantime, have a great rest of the day, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone.